Ladies and gentlemen, we may be approaching a fateful hour. All night long, bulletins have been pouring in from Berlin, claiming that D-Day is here, claiming that the invasion of Western Europe has begun. going to do something a little bit different this morning, kind of in my, our somewhat of a vision towards next year, uh, 2024, which is the 80th anniversary of D-Day, we're going to introduce a little bit of D-Day this year as well. So that's where we're going to start today. This is the first uh, of our presentations for this calendar year. And we're going to watch a film. And the film is about a group of uh, numerous DC-3, C-47 aircraft that gathered together back in 2019, the 75th anniversary of D-Day. And they flew over to Normandy to participate and also commemorate and celebrate that anniversary. So let's get right into it. Oh, and I did want to point out, this is a great photo of passing through Manhattan there and the aircraft smoking the fearsome T-6 escort uh, of these things overseas. So with that, I'd like to introduce our wing leader, Kathy Newhart, who's going to uh, welcome you to the presentation. Hi guys, thanks for coming today. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Um, I just wanted to say welcome. Um, how many of you are first timers? Oh, wow, that's fantastic. Thank you for coming. I hope that you enjoy the presentation. After the presentation, please stay around. We have docents on call for you and they can give you a complete tour. It looks like the sun's coming out, so we'll be able to give you a tour of China Hall out there on the ramp. We have two other hangers. So enjoy. Thanks. Thank you, Kathy. And uh, I'd like to thank everyone to brave the chilly weather right here. Uh, I'm freezing, so I can't wait to sit down and put on my hoodie. Okay, here's what we've got uh, planned today. So we're going to get into the presentation, the film here uh, very soon. We'll start that off by looking at the map of what was both the original North Atlantic route when we started flying airplanes over to Europe back in the early 40s and the exact route that these C-47s flew a couple of years back. Then we'll watch the film. Uh, then we're going to kind of have a discussion. I'm going to lead a discussion about D-Day and what it might mean to you guys. And then we'll have some questions and answers if, if you have any. We'll kind of show you or let you go at roughly about 12.15. And uh, as Kathy said, grab a docent, go back up to the front desk. And uh, if you want to see the rest of our facility here, because we've got a great museum hangar, big hangar over here to the west. And we've got more than just this screen. So uh, let's get right into it. Again, to set the stage uh, back in... 2019, the 75th anniversary of D-Day, uh, an idea was hatched and a group of DC-3 and C-47 owners and museums all got together under this thing they called the DC-3 Society and that also ended up being called the D-Day Squadron and they got their airplanes ready to fly these 75-year-old airplanes across the North Atlantic in support and in commemoration of the 75th anniversary of D-Day. And again, I'm trying to put together, back in 2019, we had a decent D-Day thing right here, and that uh, event turned out pretty well. We had some media coverage, and it's important, in my opinion, to the, to the psyche of our country. So I want to keep that ball rolling and next year we're going to try and do something 2024, the 80th anniversary of D-Day, we're going to try and do something a little bigger 
than our normal presentations, and this is just kind of a stepping stone to uh, hopefully keep uh, our regulars uh, continuing to think about D-Day. So here's the map, if you will, of what they did. Uh, back in the day, it was called the Blue Spruce Route, and it's what they did. You know, early in the war, we would disassemble the airplane and ship them over. And that became problematic when, one, our production ramped up so much, we had too much stuff to ship, and it takes a long time. So the powers that be created what's the best route to fly airplanes over there, and this is what it is. Now for this adventure, they all joined here. It came from all over the United States, as you'll see in the film. And they all got together in Oxford, Connecticut. And then they flew to Goose Bay, Canada, up into a Greenland name I cannot pronounce. Thank you very much. Could you say that again? Thank you very, thank you very much. That was a base built in 1942 just for this. It's still there. And then from there into Reykjavik, Iceland, down into Preswick, Scotland. And then this group all got together back again at Duxford, just outside London. And from there, that's where they staged out of Duxford for the actual flyby of the D-Day beaches and the American Cemetery. Okay, a little bit of a disclaimer. The, the film is licensed, no big deal. We're able to show it right here legally. But that means that we can't, uh, Lawn can't film that and post it on YouTube, which is what we like to do after each presentation. So he films it, posts it on YouTube for those who want to watch it. We can't do that whole thing. But what you'll see when he posts it on YouTube here in a week or two is he'll put in the trailer for this movie. Uh, I did include a couple of links for those interested. Those are in your program as well. And you can, if you want to see this again, you can go to one of those links, I forget which, and you can link yourself to where you can rent this for a very, very cheap sum. So let's watch the film. Hope you enjoy it. It's a little over an hour long. Here we go. Fuel and oil. Uh, sticking gauge is checked. Props. Props are in high RPM. Trim. I've got it set bottom of the green arc. Yeah, full pressure. Yeah, full pressure. Before it starts completely. I'm the last one left of the Pathfinders for World War II. I'm going over to France here you know, at the end of the month. I'm going to fly across the channel again in a new boat. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Got some big ocean crossings to do, and that's that's kind of the scary part. They have a soul. These airplanes have a soul. They're all exactly the same, but each one has a little something different from the other one. I don't know. It might be a once in a lifetime deal. We came from a place that no kid could ever dream of being part of something like this. We're going to restore a DC-3, and we're going to fly it to Normandy next summer. Okay, <laughs> I'm down. You know, we're all really excited to go make this recreation flight and, and honor the vets, but um, we're going across for pleasure, more or less. They were, they were going across to go to war. It was a great experience for a young kid, because that's what I was. It was serious business and a deadly business. One thing I'm glad I, I didn't get killed. We're doing this to let you know we, we don't forget your service. Every time I get in this airplane, you know, there's some 21-year-old kid flying across the English Channel with 29 paratroopers back there, younger than him, getting their fanny shot off. It's just amazing what these young kids did back then. I think it was an opportunity to really honor the greatest generation. Very few of them left. We uh, were probably going to lose the rest of them in the next 10 or 15 years. So I'm a kid. <laughs> what I'd like to see them learn is that, that freedom takes sacrifice. 
and we should not forget the men and women that lost their lives for the freedoms we have. Anyone else get emotional? Okay. I don't feel alone then. So, two things to, to start off, and then we're going to have q and I'll do the best I can. Uh, but I want to start, there was one of the airplanes that was fairly prominently figured in there was D-Day Doll. It's a CAF airplane, lives over in the Inland Empire. And it's going to be here in August, so we've got several months, at our air show, our local Camarillo Airport air show, if you want to touch living history. So the second thing I'd like to start before I get into my questions for you is Gino. Gene O'Neill right here was um, walked the beaches of D-Day, Omaha Beach, and was there in 2019. What memories did it bring back? It brought back a lot of memories. Uh, two of more than Because I was honored to lay in the at Northern Cemetery one day with the group that I had traveled with. I was there two or three days. We went in early to Paris and went on the morning and saw all the beaches, fronts, battle zones. Very, very emotional. And just to be serious, I would have loved to have been in uh, That's All Brother. Yeah. And we saw Jeff White's old, one of our old brothers flying in uh, Montana. But it wasn't to be. But I was very, very happy to see it from the ground. So you saw that flyover? I saw those 15 airplanes fly over many times. They crossed, they paralleled the beach several times, and then made a cross across the cemetery. And then they went inland for the jungles. And when I flew to Paris, Tom Rice, the elder jumper, the jumper, yeah, he was on the same airplane that I was on. So I got to speak with him at the LA airport and then again in Paris and got to, got to know him. So that was a privilege, a very, very good. Thanks, Gino. Okay, so uh, a little Q&A and I'm gonna start things off here. So let me ask, um, what does the significance of D-Day today mean to anybody? Anyone want to answer that? And from the perspective of either both uh, before you watch this and now after you've watched this, what is D-Day, June 1944, mean to you? Well, uh, for me personally, my name is Mike. I'm a docent here. Uh, my daughter's in the Air Force. She was stationed in Italy. We went to visit her. We spent four days in Paris as well as Italy. We spent one day going up to the beaches of Normandy and we were going to take the train up to Cannes. The French trains were on strike. Surprise, surprise. So we took a bus tour up there and our guide on the bus was a French woman who her parents lived in Cannes during the war. Her Paris house was occupied by the Nazis for four years. She had quite vivid memories of that. And her, as she spoke about the tour that we were going to, she spoke about T-Day as the liberation of France, not the invasion. The Germans invaded. When the Allies came short, that was the liberation. And I found that perspective just incredible because it was completely different than anything I've ever heard. And I enjoyed that and I've shared that with museum visitors over and over that it was the liberation.
generation. And my wife, who is not much of a history buff, stood on those beaches overlooking the bay. She stood there and cried. I'm about to cry right now thinking about it. Avery, if you could let uh, John bring the microphone over to you, please. My father in law, Colonel Robert Perry, threw a P 38 over those beaches. And he took out a, a, a gun that saved a lot of guys on the ground and, and down by it. And that's the only battle they can remember that the United States fought without a, 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 a way out for our guys. The only way they survived was to get off those beaches. And we were battling and stunning. I mean, we had a way of getting guys out. And I served the environment. Our job was to raise my pilots on the north, did not. Not seeing them in the something with an obvious way of how they made the attempts or not. I let them find out. Amazing. So, who are, my, uh, who are my pilots in here I can pick on? Me, I guess. I'll let you, you, you've already participated. So I was uh, fairly impressed. Uh, John Luckadoo, if I said his name right, he was the gentleman who flew the B-17 over. And he didn't do the blue spruce route, landing four times, he flew direct. And 250 hours-ish total flight time is not a lot. Uh, but flying at wave top height for an hour until he burned down enough gas, i.e. got light enough that he could climb his airplane up to something a little more survivable than three feet at 250 hours and 20 years old. Those are some fairly impressive numbers and an impressive feat. Okay, so duck gonna pick on you what do you think the theme of this movie was i think the theme was you know, how, to, how to come together as a group and pull something off and so forth it meant a great deal to me um, we lived in new jersey for 20 years and my neighbor was the second wave to be dead while i was 99 years old this past year he was part of the best kind of group down in uh, San Diego, he flies over the He was on the charter flight uh, on Delta, going to Norman this year. And he started speaking to me about his experience. He was in the second wave, he drove a, it was called an M4, which was a powered artillery weapon. And he said that the biggest challenge he had as he came off was avoiding the bodies of the beach. That Bob uh, is I just celebrated his 99th birthday. He's already signed up for this June. He wants to go back. And uh, very, very emotional for me, so I imagine. Wonderful people. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, so you got emotional too, didn't you? Okay, I'm going to pick on the young kids. So, somewhat near the end of that, there was the younger guy, uh, Frankie. Ortega, I think it was. He was a para-jump reenactor. And he talked about history from the perspective of living history. So he was there. He got to shake the hands of Tom Rice and some of the folks who were there. And so in the age of instant information on the internet, what I'll call archival history versus you know, living history. Thoughts on archival history and what that means to you versus living history as best you may have experienced that. And what does that mean to you? Uh, I think that uh, archival history, which um, obviously is much more readily available to, uh, to access, even though it is much more readily available, um, it doesn't kind of foster the same like idea of like what, how like, how it affected like you and like how, like the scale of things and that sort of thing. 
So when when you when you read your history textbook and you hear about oh the, the Perry drop was on for D Day, they were very important. Like you can you can kind of think about that, but you can't really register like what like important means until you uh, you kind of observe what happens more so and just learn about it because you kind of believe it more, like you can accept it as true when you read something, but you kind of believe it when you, when you see something. Great, thank you. I'm going to go backwards a little bit. How many of us have not seen this picture? Okay, one. Granted, you're in a you're in an older group here. So these are literally 18, 19, 20 year old men. And Avery said it best. There's one way, and one way only that they're going to survive this, and that's going to go, and that's to go that way. They can't go backwards. They're going that way. And, um, yeah, they're your age. So it's nice to meet those guys. Okay, so thank you very much for putting up with me. Let's uh, wrap this thing up. So here's our next presentation. We're going to talk about that, the Storch, and our other German airplane. We have an ME-108. It's not the fighter ME-109, but it, the 109 got some of its lineage from the ME-108. It's over there in our maintenance hangar, for those who want to see it. And we're going to talk about both those airplanes and commemorate VE Day, Victory in Europe Day. And then in June, I kind of mentioned this up front, we're going to have a guest speaker come talk about attack aviation, U.S. attack aviation. Thank you all for being here. Thanks for putting up with the weather and have a great day. Enjoy our facility.